it is so good to see you all and to have this opportunity to talk to you. I told um, Professor Ross that you all can interrupt me. I might not see you in the chat, but she'll look at the chat for me. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, this topic, which really is my life. So that means that I can get a little crazy. So you're gonna to have to stop me. I wanna, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why I think this moment is so important why you in this moment is so important. I know you think, oh, I'm just in social work school, but you really are social um, justice warriors. When I decided, I, I am an attorney by training, and I decided when I left the nonprofit that I wanted to come to social work school, because I think it is so important that social workers understand what um, the concept of justice is and advocacy and their role in the lives of children and families in this country, especially at this moment. So there's a sense of urgency that I bring to this, a search of a sense of um, admiration. I say that I am a, a JD, but I'm definitely a wannabe social worker. I think I am officially a social worker based on all the work that I have done. So I am very happy to be here. I think I embody this idea of an interdisciplinary approach to the work, right? That I am a person who, um, my story and where I come from, I grew up in Queens. I'm the product of a single mom. I say that my mom is from Trinidad and Tobago and she um, grew up in an orphanage when her mother died in childbirth. So we got maternal health issues there. We got foster care issues there. We got my mom um, being a single mom in there and we got immigration status. So all that I do, I say that what I do for a living and who I am is the same thing. We all have personal narratives. You all have reasons that you're doing this work. It's not about, oh, these clients over here and me over here. And for me, that's one of the most important skills that you can have when you're doing this work is that sense of empathy, that sense of partnership, that sense that we're in this together, that sense of respect, that sense that, oh, I may think that you're making this really bad decision, 18 year old, but I believe that you have the right to make your knuckleheaded decision at this time and I'm gonna be with you and I'm gonna love you no matter what. Mom, I may have to report you to ACS for this crazy thing that you did, but I'm not gonna hide behind your back. I'm gonna tell you that we're gonna have to do this. We're gonna walk together through this journey and we're gonna get better because I'm not gonna hide behind a book or a title or any of those things because I love this work that I do and I love the people that I serve. When I started my career early after I practiced law, I worked at the Administration for Children's Services, which was nothing that I ever thought that I was going to do. When I got to um, ACS and I live, I don't know if I said that I, my husband and I met in law school and we got married and we moved to Harlem. So we have raised our three children in Harlem. And um, when I found out that one in 10 children in Harlem were in foster care, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, what in the world is going on? Second of all, do people in this community even know that this is true? And how do we work in communities, not just to pluck children out, but to give people the resources that they need in order to be supportive of their children and of their families? How do they get to thrive? Now, this is 25 years ago. I know I look young but I am not young. We've been talking about this forever. This idea of giving families what they need for as long as they need it so that they can be successful. That is what I kind of was learning when I went to the child welfare. We didn't talk much about child well-being. We weren't talking about the whole child. We weren't talking about an ecological approach to community and to family. We were talking about very limited um, tools that we had in our toolbox, which was something called preventive services. I know I looked, um, when we first met, I was jotting down where many of you are from. So I know that I have brothers and sisters in here from New York Family, from Children's Aid, from JCCA, from Eagle Academy, from Children's Village, from hospitals, from schools. So you all know that sometimes for many people in this field, there's not much in your toolbox that you can use when a family is in crisis. When I was at the Administration for Children's Services, that's why we were like, listen, y'all up here on the 18th floor have never even been into a community. We need to figure out if we can develop community coalitions and partnerships so we can hear about what families need, not about what you think a family needs, but what a family really needs. And if it is that she needs a washing machine, literally somebody asked me today, but if a child comes to school and they're, they're disheveled and they're, um, they're, they're um, dirty, 
aren't you concerned about that, um, Professor Williams Eisman? I'm like, yeah, I'm concerned about that. I'm going to ask questions. My first instinct is not going to be to pull them out of the house. It's very different if mom has a drug problem or if mom needs a washing machine. It's very different as mom just got a new job and so she can't you know, get everything that she needs and she needs somebody in the house to help her out or she hasn't been home and she's leaving the kids at home um, and they're by themselves. So risk looks very different. I won't get you into this because I know you know this, right? That 80% of the children in New York City who are in foster care are there because of neglect. To me, neglect is another way of saying poverty. Neglect is another way of saying we'd rather spend our money on something else than helping people with what they need so that they can give their children what the supports that their children need. So I'm a part of a coalition right now where we're called narrowing the front door of the child welfare system. We feel like if the door is open, people are gonna come in. So we need to narrow that door and really only use it in those situations where there's really imminent risk to the child and safety and we need to really take some of those funds and put them in the hands of people in the community, of workers, of, of families, so that they can be more successful. Okay, after I did that at the Children's Services for 13 years, and I felt changed from my work, but I felt like when I was at child welfare, that was once a, a crisis happened, right? Nobody was going to child welfare because everything was all good. So I decided that I wanted to go to an organization called the Harlem Children's Zone, talk about the ultimate prevention work. We talk, have talked about in this class this idea of how are social workers involved in prevention work, real prevention, not just treatment, not just intervention. How can you be the part of, of families and in partnership with families and children and adults in order to really make sure that they have what they need? The Harlem Children's Zone is that for me. I am totally obsessed with the model. Um, during the Obama administration, they did actually take some fun federal funds and put millions of dollars into this model and replicate it in 20 um, cities across the um, states. And right now, um, the new CEO is working with about five different communities, Atlanta, Newark, I think some uh, Minneapolis, to really look at post-COVID, how do we work to rebuild communities post-COVID? I wanna tell you a little bit about my community because I live in the zone. I am um, 10 blocks from my office. So when I walked in the community, it was my community. When I saw kids at the bodega and they were like uh, trying to not make eye contact with me, I'd be like, excuse me, Malik, is that you? When I'm in church, I'm in church with people that I am accountable to. When I'm at the laundromat, when I'm at the playground, I am Miss Ann 24 seven when I was the CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone. In Harlem, Central Harlem right now, 64% of children are still born into poverty. Nope, I didn't say a third world country. I said right now, where many of you may be, 64% of the children in Harlem are still born into poverty. 54% of the children are living in households that are headed by females. Now that's not a bad thing. I said I was raised by a female. We know that the reason that that's complicated is because of the amount of money that women make in comparison to white men and women of color. In the St. Nicholas Housing Project, where one of our schools is, a family of four makes $18,000 a year. A girlfriend of mine was recently talking about the poverty index and she was like, I don't know what poverty index they're talking about because especially in New York City, what they're saying that we should be able to live on, no one has been able to live in that for a long time. So we are certainly undercounting the amount of people in New York City who are poor. 50% of the adults that live in that community are unemployed. It's the St. Nicholas Housing Projects. So many older people live there, many people who are on social security, so they're not really in the workforce. 80% of the young people who are there are what people will call disconnected youth. You know I don't call them disconnected youth or at-risk youth. I say that we as adults are disconnected from them. But 80% of those young people between 18 and 24 are not connected to school and not connected to work. And I wonder right now, there's been so much stuff going on in the community over these past couple of weeks about how is that even getting worse? A story that I would tell you as I was walking to the hairdresser about two, no, about a month ago. And it was right when the kids were starting to go back to school. So maybe less than a month ago. And I was seeing, I'm right next to the 32nd precinct. And I was like, why are all these cop cars out? Like, I know I've been having a nice relaxing summer, but what is going on? And I had this idea of over-policing in my community. And so I just looked and I was like, all right, well, maybe there's something going on, but I didn't pay any attention to it. 
And then I went out to the Dwayne Reed the next week around the same time. And these, again, police officers on the corner, police officers in front of the Dwayne Reed. And I was like, all right, there's gotta be some kind of beef going on for the kids at Bread and Roses. So I attend um, Abyssinian Baptist Church and uh, Reverend Butts is the pastor. And so when he was talking this Sunday, he was talking about the fact that there is some kind of major gang war that's going on between the middle school and the high school kids, right? On 135th Street and 8th Avenue at Bread and Roses. And so he said something like, so we, you know, the men at the church, we need to go in there. We need to figure out, we need to take the, the, the school back and, and we're going to bring the police with me. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait, what? We're going to take the police with me? What have we learned over the past 19 months of bringing police into schools? And I was thinking to myself, Reverend Butts, who I love, who in the community are experts in this that you should be talking to? I mean, now listen, I believe in prayer in the Bible, but I also believe that some good sense goes along with that. Who are the experts in that community, the other principals, the other uh, folks that we should look at that and absolutely say, yes, there's something that needs to happen. That is happening right now, you all, right? That's not, and literally when I was getting on this Zoom, I was like, there goes the ambulances and for me, makes me anxious every time I hear a cop car and an ambulance coming by. I'm like, what is going on? I told you I'm raising my kids here. I have a 26-year-old boy who I'm always worried about, a 28-year-old daughter, a 19-year-old daughter. I'm always worried about them when in the community. But this is where we still are. We're in this precarious situation because there's a lot of young people who are not connected to work or not going to school. I wanna tell you that in the Harlem Children's Zone of those 25,000 kids that were in the zone, 27%, 27 to 30% of them had a family member that was killed. No, nope, not a family member that died, not a family member that you know had a heart attack and died of natural causes, but had a family member that was killed, our middle school and our high school students. You wanna to talk to me about ACEs? You wanna to talk to me about adverse childhood experiences? What is that like? And I guess I kind of understand the maladaptive behavior that comes out of that when you feel like you live in a community where anything can happen and where you can be going from block to block and there are different gangs and different places that you can, you can walk. We decided at the Harlem Children's Zone that we wanted to create a counter narrative to that. We didn't want to just look at a map that showed how many kids, how many people were incarcerated in that overlay. Because if you overlay uh, the zone, we have the highest rates of incarceration. We have the highest rates of asthma. We have the highest rates of anything that you could think of that's not good. And we decided we wanted to change that and have the highest rates of young people who are going to college. Not because college is some panacea, but because college makes you think and act differently about, think about your life differently. It makes you have a goal to work towards. It makes me look you in the eyes and say, yep, nope, we're not doing that. You're doing this, so you need to get back in school and we're gonna go on college visits and we're gonna give you all the money that you need and we're gonna wrap our arms around you. That is the concept of the Harlem Children's Zone. The Harlem Children's Zone has a crazy idea. What it says is, suppose we give children what they need until they don't need it anymore. How about everything? How about if they need early childhood care, really good care? How about if they need a prenatal program? How about after school programs? So all of those kids that are in that bread and roses that are up the street, I was like, they need to be in a program somewhere or else. Of course, they're gonna be hanging up in front of the Dwayne Reed trying to get in trouble. How about connection to a two year college program where they can get some skills and really figure out what they love? I mean, yes, they're 18 years old. They don't know what they love yet and what they're good at. How about domestic violence um, uh, services that are available to you if you're an African woman that lives on 116th and Lenox Avenue and you're really afraid because you don't really trust anybody, but you've heard that there's this program and this place where you can go to get some help. How about we have substance abuse programs that are available, not next week, but when you need it. How about we decide that our kids are not gonna be two and three years behind in school, but they're gonna be on grade level. And that excellence is going to be what we want. And something crazy, we're gonna work in partnership with their parents. And we're not gonna think that their parents are the cause of this. We're gonna understand the concept of systemic racism. We're gonna understand how my beautiful community, the, I call it the Mecca of African-American community in this country can have the statistics that I just talked to you about. What do we have to do to work with children and families? And then what is the role of social workers, of healthcare workers, of, of teachers in that together? 
Well, I say you have to have a vision and an execution that is disciplined and straight. The problems are complex, my dear MSW students, so the solutions have to be complex. That's why you're taking this course that talks about integration and about a pipeline. It ain't about one thing. It's never been about one thing. Middle-class people don't need one thing. I just told you I had three kids. When people say to me, what's the one thing that kids need? I said, what's the one thing that your kids need? My kids needed piano and guitar and basketball and a tutor and mental health. And why do poor kids got to have one thing? They need it all until they don't need it anymore. I wanted to tell you the story, which makes me sad, of um, in the Harlem Children's Zone, we had about 36 different programs. We had two charter schools, which Jeffy Canada is really known for to be an, an educational reform person. But what people don't know is that we were in public schools, about eight different public schools that were in the zone. So I just talked to you a lot about, I don't know why I have violence in my mind, so I'm sorry. We'll talk, you'll ask me other things about other things later. But I have a after school worker in my mind named Damon. Damon was a, um, as is many people who work at the Harlem Children's Home, used to be a kid in our program. He was one of those kids when you looked into his eyes, you were like, oh no, I can see in you something that you can't see in your head because all you are right now is a knucklehead. He went to school, he got his degree, he graduated in May of maybe it was 2018, 2019. We have a program called a Peacemaker Program where we have young people from the community who are AmeriCorps volunteers at the time that would come because we wanted them to get excited about giving back and about being teachers in the community or about being social workers or about you know working in the community and being there because sometimes someone who was a kid in that program can see themselves in a different way than someone else who feels like they have a fancy degree and wants to come in and fix everybody. Damon went over to his girlfriend's house in East Harlem and was visiting her. And when he was visiting her, her ex-boyfriend came over to the house and shot and killed him. 20 or 25 years old. I, I don't think he was 26 years old yet. The, as you can imagine, we had to deal with not all, I mean, all that had to do with his family and the community for you losing this beautiful soul, but he had a class of second and first graders who adored him. So we had to figure out how we were gonna tell these first and second graders on 135th and Matt Fifth Avenue, PS197, a place where 48% of them were from domestic, a local domestic violence shelter. There was one social worker in that school. The kids were K-5. So we went, and as Jeff Canada has always taught me, it's not me sending somebody. As a leader, I go. If there's a place where no one else wants to go, if there's something hard somebody wants to do, I need to model it for them, so I go. And when we got there, we had a whole plan about how we were gonna tell these second graders that Mr. Damon wasn't coming back. We go and we're, I'm like in a room talking to the staff first because the staff is all broken up. I think I told you that we um, worked with Nadine Burke Harris um, who is one of the preeminent doctors about ACEs. And we did a study with her and we found out that uh, it was about 30%, 30, 35% of our kids had an ACE score of four and above. I told her, I'm glad you're not doing the adults because I'm sure all of us got an ACE score of seven and above because we all got interesting backgrounds. That's why we come to this work. So I knew that my staff was really gonna take this very hard. I know that they try to be tough and they try to be there for the kids, but I also want them to take care of themselves. I want them to show emotions, sorta, because then I need them to pull themselves together to get back into the classroom with the kids. So we go there and I'm told that the DOE is gonna send some social workers over, so that's great. And then I heard that we had some MSW students from Columbia that was gonna join us. So as we're preparing and we're dividing up and we're figuring out how we're gonna go into the classrooms, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Where are the MSW students? And they tell me that the MSW students are not coming because they've been too traumatized from working in that school for the past three months. So depending on when I tell this story, what I'm feeling, what's going on with me, I could either get really upset 
and be like, how do, how do you do that? But I've practiced my whole life putting my emotions down and being tough and just going through the fire. Maybe it was a good thing that they didn't show up. Maybe we got to figure out a way to make sure that they're taking care of themselves so that they can show up in those moments for those second graders. I tell you that story because this work is not easy. This work is not cute. This work is not about something that you read in a book. This, book is a, this work is about being there and taking care of yourself, which I will say over and over again. So that, someone said, I shouldn't say that. The nap ministry was like, you're not supposed to rest just so that you can do more work. I don't know, I'm like an old West Indian girl from Harlem. I'm like, I do believe I gotta fill up my cup so that my cup, there's something in my cup when somebody needs me. And so I wanna I want say that to you all as you do this work, as you come to this work, finding the ways to take care of yourself so that you can show up when it's needed. Okay, Harlem Children's Zone, based in a community. We think that place matters. You'll hear this concept, um, place-based strategy, because we think that you gotta get deep into the community because then that's how you know what's going on, right? I haven't called up any of my uh, old G's in St. Nick yet, but I bet you there's a couple of telephone calls that I can make to find out what's going on at Bread and Roses and to figure out what's the strategy that we need to to use. God bless Reverend Butts, that strategy is not going to come from the pulpit. That strategy is going to come from the community where there's going to be people there that they respect and help us figure that out. Jeff Canada decided that we needed to do a pipeline of programs. And so for him, that was baby college, where we can have mothers and fathers engaged in a prenatal course for nine weeks. And if you can't come, we go to your house. If it's snowing, we come to you. We give you, we, um, we raffle away a month's rent as an incentive to make, make people come. If you come to all nine sessions, we do fun stuff. We get people to come so that you, who doesn't want to go to baby college? I say even the drug dealers in my community want their kids and their, and their families to be in baby college. We have a program called the GEMS programs for three and four year olds. 100% of the kids what got to school, school ready. This was 25% of those little ones had some special needs. And many of them, this is their first interaction in school, right? You know about the 30 million word gap that in, in communities 50 blocks from where I live, three and four year olds are going to school with 30 million more words than my little babies that we have here. And we're just trying to close that gap a little bit for them by the time that they get to school. We have two charter schools with 2000 kids in it. It, and, and the only thing that's really good about charter schools, you all, is that it's 11 months out of the year. And the reason it's 11 months out of the year is because my kids are not going to Vail or the Bahamas or to you know Jamaica during the summer. So I want them with me. I want to be taking them. I want to use New York City as their, as their background. I want to have fun with them. I want them to start thinking about their life differently. And I trust me to do that. And so it is 11 months from eight o'clock in the morning to like 10 o'clock at night. Actually, the community center is open all the time because you never know what can happen. And somebody needs to knock on that community center door and get in very carefully and, and quickly in case something happens. We talk about scale, which is our third thing. We have 10, over 10,000 kids that were in the zone. When I say 25,000, that includes the adults too, because we didn't wanna just do a program for 400 or 300 or 500 kids. We don't want to do that. We were like, we want to do something for a whole community. When we said we don't want to leave any child behind, we're like, we're going to take them all. And we also believe that there's like a gravitational pull. Like if Raheem on 142nd Street is going to college and y'all know Raheem has been like into all kinds of stuff, it makes them believe like this can be a college going culture. And I'm going to talk to you about that a little later because this concept of making, believe, making people believe something that they can't see yet making them have confidence in themselves and setting the expectation about this is what we're going to do as a community it becomes very important to a couple of things that I want to talk to you about. So for us, scale is always important. We don't do anything small. The collection of data, I really get upset when people are like, well, I just want to work in a program because that's all black and brown people just need another program. Well, I, I don't just need a program. I need to know that the program is working. And can you show me the data that's really proven that this is helping somebody? Like, I love y'all, but I don't know, just sitting in a session with you or just you doing counseling, does that work? Are there some people who are better with adolescents? Are there some people who are really good with eight-year-olds? They used to call me the parent whisperer. I'm great with angry parents because I'm like, I hear you, girl, I'm angry too. But we got to just sit down and we got to have to figure out how we got to go back into that school. 
people have different talents. There are different um, skill sets and there's data that we need to be looking at. And just because it's social services doesn't mean that there's no accountability to our the people who we serve. I'm not gonna call them our clients. So we had over 600 different pieces of data that we looked at from the baby college to the GEMS program, to the schools. And every year, again, I was in the room with staff going through, so how'd you do? And did you get your professional development? And are you good? Because guess what? I'm not waiting another Halloween or another Christmas or another holiday in a child's life. A year in a child's life is a big deal. I can't have you just screwing that up because you're not good. I get it. We can have a conversation about professional development and all that kind of stuff. But I will tell you that the, I want the best and the brightest. I don't think a new teacher does really well in my school. I don't think new social workers do really well in my school. I like people who have a little bit of gravitas who've done this before because it's, it's difficult doing this work. It's not like working in a private school on 85th Street. Not, not that there's anything wrong with private schools on 85th Street. My kids went to private schools, but I'm just saying that it's different and the population is different. Cultivating a, um, cultivating a climate, a culture of excellence is super important to me. I hope you're hearing it in my voice a little bit, which is that the Harlem Children's Zone was not an easy place to work. It's not an easy place to work because we're really serious about what we're doing. We think that we are urgent. There's a sense of urgency that we feel. And we do feel like very often in communities, people do not get high quality services. So our values, and I'm gonna share them with you because I think it's really important for you to hear this and for you to understand it is, first of all, the first one was children first. So that sometimes means like, Oh, well, Miss Ann, I need to do professional development. How come you can't give us a half day? I'm like, I really think I'd love for y'all to do professional development, but where are the kids supposed to go? So you want me to let the kids out at 12 o'clock in the afternoon so that they can be on the street so you can have professional development? No, we're gonna have to figure that out. So let's push in the after school staff a little earlier and on those days have them come in and we'll start after school a little earlier. When you Think about children first. You design programs that help the children in the building, not the adults. I wish we were in person because I would be like, say that with me. In the Harlem Children's Zone, we put children first, not the adults. Because when you start designing things for adults, you get distracted from what your very clear goal is about where you're trying to get these young people. Our second goal is excellence. So that's an excellence, everything that we do from our music program to our recreation program, to our college program, everything. Strategic relentlessness. It used to be whatever it takes. We are like, we call ourselves like a little gang. We are a little gang and we will do anything for each other. We'll be there for each other. And so we're like, whatever it takes. That means that Saturday, Sunday, late at night, if there's a missing child in the community, we're not I mean, we are calling the cops, but we're not just letting the cops look for the child. We are out in the parks. We're looking. We're trying to figure that out because this is our community. Respect, which is important, and it's super important for me because sometimes professionals, y'all, get it twisted. Y'all think that the mom is not the person that I should listen to. Y'all think that if you come in and the superintendent and the principal are like, oh, this mom, I told her this is what she needed to do and that you're gonna bring her in front of me for me to chastise her, that doesn't feel respectful. We're not doing that. And so this idea of respect is something I needed to remind my staff all the time. Your position, your degree does not make you any better than anybody here. And in fact, you cannot say you love the kids, but you disrespect their parents. Let me say that again. You cannot say that you love kids and you love this community work, but you disrespect in their parents. And so that was really important to us. We had another value called best selves to best serve. I wish I could turn off myself right now and say, who, who can understand what that means? Best selves to best serve means that we people who come into this uh, field, I think that many of us work ourselves to death. We got to sit, we got, we got to do it. We got to be there. I'm the one who has to be there. And I get it and I love it. But if you are running yourself ragged, you are not having the patience that I need you to have with that seven-year-old. If you're running yourself ragged, you're not thinking clearly. You're not giving me the innovative ideas. We're not doing different things. So this idea, and I loved it because then afterwards I heard that when I left, everybody was like, Miss Ann said that it's best selves to best serve, so I need a mental health day. I was like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we need to make sure that we are doing this all the time, but so you can use it all the time. And our last value is that we are an army of love. I said it, 
the L word. And maybe because I was a woman um, CEO and maybe because I'm a black woman, I'm gonna talk about love because it ain't certainly the salaries. Y'all ain't y'all not in this field for the salaries that you're gonna make. So there's some other inspiration. There's something else that you have to want to do in order to be in this. And I say that it's love. It's love for each other. It's love for our community. And it's certainly love for our children. Are y'all writing down questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. Y'all so mesmerized by everything that I'm saying. Okay, I wanna talk about culture change. So I said to you, think about this community where no kids were really going to um, college. I think that there's some crazy statistic and I don't know what it is right now, but maybe 60 or 70% of the kids in this zone were going to college. We were like, what? Oh, no, graduating from high school. We were like, okay, no, we're gonna change that. So how does one change a concept and a, an idea that everybody can get in, um, on board with? And Jeff Canada really is the master of that. The way that he does it is that he's like, everybody's going. No, not, you know, you know how people would say, oh, Vanessa, you don't look like college material. I think you need to go to a different kind of school. Or like Brenda, I think, you know, maybe you're gonna go into something separate. I don't think college is right for you. We took the decision out of the hands of the adults that were working in the institution. And we said, all of the kids have to apply to a, a CUNY school. All the kids have to apply to a SUNY school. Now, if they end up going, might be a different situation. We'll have that conversation with their parents. But you, crazy person with your internalized racism and your all other kind of stuff that you're working out on these families and these children are not gonna make the adult, the, the decision for these kids. And guess what happened? 100% of the kids started graduating from high school. 100% of the kids started going to college. Kids weren't different. They weren't any smarter or bright, less bright, more prepared. What we did was we changed the expectation and we held people accountable in a different way. I use that because I wanted to give you two more examples. And the last example that I'm gonna give you is about a culture change around emotion, um, black and brown people's uh, perception or um, how we deal with emotional wellness. And I'm saying emotional wellness instead of mental health because nobody in my community wants to talk about mental health. So we just, Jeff decided maybe 10 years ago that when we were looking at the children, we saw that 45% of the kids at the Harlem Children's Zone were overweight and obese. Are you, does that sound a lot to you guys? Surprising or not surprising? Okay, so we were like, that's a lot of kids. And people would say to us, but you're a school and an after-school program. Why are you gonna be concerned about childhood obesity? And guess what my answer was? Because when you love kids, you're not just concerned about one thing, you're concerned about their whole being. How am I gonna get them to college and they're gonna have high blood pressure and stroke and cancer and all of the things that we know are in their, um, in, in our culture and not take a shot at trying to have a healthy existence from the time when they're little. Why, those little gems with their cute little self that I have for 10 hour a day, why don't I start to talk to them about um, woe foods and go foods and slow foods so that they can start to understand how much ice cream or French fries or where they go to McDonald's, what they should be ordering. But why wouldn't I talk to moms about, go, listen, the first time I went to Whole Foods, I was so intimidated. I was like, what is this? What kind of food is that or whatever? Why wouldn't I think that some of our, our moms would be like, let's walk through these aisles and figure out what, I know collard greens, but I don't know what these other kind of greens over here are and what's in season and whatnot to have a community perspective to help. So what we did was we looked around the country and we were like, all right, so other people in communities must be doing this. This is definitely the Harlem Children's Own way. We looked around y'all and I found one little tiny white community in Somerville, Massachusetts that had 400 kids in a program. I was like, that's it. Nobody else is doing this for like thousands of kids. So we took whatever we could from that that model. We hired Bridgespan, which is a consultant firm. We put together our Harlem Children's Own flavor and we created a, a program called Healthy Harlem. So Healthy Harlem, and as I said, we never do anything small, started with 2,000 kids. It went to 4,000 kids. And then in the end, we had 7,000 kids indoctrinated in this idea of, nope, we're not having any soda. Nope, we're gonna exercise. Nope, we're gonna make healthy choices. You know how those, the older women in the projects wanted to kill me when I told them that they couldn't have Kool-Aid at their community meetings. They were like, Miss Ann, why are you trying to be white? I'm like, I get it, Miss Ida. I'm not trying to be white, but 
but I'm just saying we need to let's try these other ways of, of, of doing this because with your diabetes and your leg cut off, I want you to be healthy, right? So it had to become a whole community perspective. There's a paper that we wrote on it, which I will give to Professor Ross so that you can see. It is a beautiful example about being able to get BMIs down. We um, hired Mathematica so that we can evaluate it. So we created a program which was about prevention. Let me say that word again, because not all of the kids were overweight and obese, right? Some of the kids were. So what did we need to do to keep those that were not um, overweight in the prevention category? Then we had a category of kids called get fit, not the fat kids we gotta get uh, skinny, not the separate program, so we're gonna stigmatize them. We all gonna be healthy up in this thing. Not the lose weight because we're not, you know, we're not trying to make anybody anorexic and we knew that teenagers are growing. So there was all this science that was involved in it. And that Jeff Canada tells a very funny story about that, which I'm going to get wrong. But his story is that every time he would hire a consultant and he'd be like, okay, well, show me the data. Have the kids lost, how much weight have the kids lost? And the consultant would come up with all kinds of reasons why nobody lost anything. And he'd be like, fired, fired. I, am, I need to see the data that's showing that we are making progress. This ain't about, oh, well, it's complicated and kids are growing. And he's like, yep, no, we're not doing it. So we ended up finally finding a consultant that was like, this is the healthy amount of weight that we should be thinking about. And we really focus less on weight and more on BMI. And then the last category of kids, you guys, were kids who were high risk. So who had diabetes or other things and other medical conditions so that we could make sure that they were um, in a special category. The implication of that and the implementation, as you can imagine, was insane for 7,000 kids. Each program, people were, I was, people were sweating. I was given bonuses based on how much, you know, uh, your progress each program, after school program was made. In. But we were able to be successful and we were able to replicate it year after year. I'm going to show you about that. That's just an example about prevention and treatment and intervention and having fun and a community doing it all at once. Good. Alavine, is that how I pronounce your name? I appreciate you going back and forth because I feel like I'm talking to myself, but it's okay because I like talking to myself, especially when I'm talking about stuff like this. Okay, I want to talk about, I'm going to take a breath. What's in the chat? Serving the whole child internally, externally, and beyond. Yes, that okay. is right. That is, no, what, that is what we learn when we talk about an ecological approach, right? You fancy social workers. And when you all learn about the whole child, this is what, this is what the whole child application looks like in a community setting. Okay, I wanna show you something that we did before the pandemic, which I'm glad that we set it up before the pandemic because we have been using it a lot now post pandemic, given all of the mental health issues that we have. I am not gonna go into because you all know, if I tell you that I'm working with 10,000 kids, you can only imagine how many of those kids have had a family member who has died from COVID. It is again insane to think about the level of loss. It is again insane to think about how does that reside beside joy and moving forward? Because both of those things have to reside, right? It's not just about grief counseling for everybody or how do we do something that's healing for everybody and also paying attention as it comes up because maybe it's not gonna show up in the fourth grader now but I need somebody to remember when it may show up in that eighth grader later and not just tell me he's a bad kid. And I'm like, what's this the anniversary? Oh, this is the anniversary of his grandma passing away. I need somebody to love kids enough that they remember that. Okay, I wanna show you these slides about the emotional wellness um, initiative that we started. I did a presentation this summer with uh, Ibrahim Kindi. And what I was talking about was community approaches to trauma and healing. And so I always start with happy looking kids because people are always like, kids in the hood look terrible, you know, we're looking terrible and it's all sad. And for me, joy, and hopefully you'll hear about that and, and uh, you've heard it in my speeches about love and about moving forward. The timeline is nothing that's new. You all know about this, how there was so much that's going on. We had COVID, we had George Floyd's move, uh, murder, we had racial justice, and we have kids that I already told you had all this trauma in their lives from before, they were experiencing COVID in a different kind of way. And I shouldn't say kids and adults, those first early days, it was all of us not really knowing what was gonna happen. I talked to you a little bit about the Harlem Children's Zone and about, oops, and about wraparound services. Sorry, folks. Um, 2,100 employees, I don't think I said to you. 
So getting 2,100 employees to do anything, and when you have 800 of them who are full-time and 1,200 who are part-time on purpose, because we want young people to get jobs here so this can be their first experience of work and then we'll send them off. Over $100 million budget so that I can do things like innovate and start my own programs and decide that I'm gonna create a, um, an emotional wellness initiative and not have to wait to write a grant for somebody to think that it's a good idea. And we can try out things so that we can then they can be replicated. Our goal is a lot of different things, but ultimately college graduation and not just so that you can get debt, but that you can get connected to a livable wage. So when I say staff and community needs, again, I hope you're hearing from me is that I don't do anything that I'm like, it's just about those poor people that we're working with. It's all of us because all about 80% of the people who worked at the Harlem Children's Zone were from a commu the community or from similarly situated community. We talked about this idea of being in crisis, which kind of happens so much, struggling, surviving, thriving, excelling. Again, folks, this was before the pandemic when everybody was walking around with butterflies in their stomach. And I know it looks different on an 18-year-old 18, uh, 18 that you think is walking around with his pants kind of hanging down, but he that anxiety that he's working walking around with all the time and the level that he has to keep so that he's as he's walking home, he's got to be ready for anything that jumps off. Right, that level of stress is debil debilitating in some cases. So we, of course, I, I love talking about trauma-informed, but we decided that we wanted to talk more about a healing-centered approach. I said to you, I might not have made this exactly clear. So while we have a full staff of, of after-school worker, of early childhood workers, we have a medical clinic that is connected and on staff in the school, we have a cadre of, of um, social workers. We have a lead social worker, we have supervisors, and then we have so social workers that are, are assigned to each one of the grades. And then also for our what we call our pipeline programs, which are outside of Promise Academy. And so this idea of realize what's going on, recognize, respond, and resist, we, we talk about in terms of not always feeling like we've gotta fix it right away, but that we're gonna find a long-term solution. We designed an emotional wellness hub. We started by thinking about what principles we wanted. I called it emotional wellness because we did surveys. And again, nobody wanted to be like, um, get mental health services. I say this because adolescents are my favorite. When there was a crime that went down in Harlem, I would always say the perpetrator was one of my kids and the victim. And it may not, you all may know this, but even if you're a perpetrator of a crime, there's trauma that's associated with that. And so getting a group of 16 year old, really tough ex gang members to sit around and wanna do therapy, probably not gonna happen, but they might do a group session with another person who they respect who used to be a person that, that was in their community. So thinking about what those techniques were and the training and the fact that we all needed to focus on wellness. We created a culture of self care that included everyone. We hired staff that were expertise, we thought about it in the same way that I said to you that we looked at the um, Healthy Harlem strategy and the college going strategy, that it was gonna be a change management perspective. And then as with any system, because the Harlem Children's Zone is a system too, there's policies and procedures that you need to change in order to make sure that you're um, getting to where you wanted to. I'm just sharing you with this because it was so important for us to articulate what those pillars of emotional wellness were. It wasn't that everything was gonna be um, fixed, but that you had to be aware of what was happening with you. We wanted you to have healthy connections. And again, children, teachers, workers, moms, angry moms, right? I, I led the angry mom group because it was so important for us to be able to figure out what was going on with us. And I can't ask other people to go to therapy and to sleep, get more sleep and to eat well and to exercise if I'm not doing it myself, right? And I'm gonna say amen to that. Because when I say I have to model this, I don't care how much, oh, I don't have any time, I'm the CEO, I've got to do all of those things too. The knowledge, so that you can see where it's coming up, especially for teachers who many of them didn't know, and the importance of social workers working in partnership with them. We had a set of offerings. The only thing that I want to show you here was for staff and for students and families, so that it could be fun um, Zumba that we did at the Armory for parents, which was free. We want to have support groups. We want to have peer emotional, um, uh, peer uh, wellness ambassadors. We want to do fun book clubs. I was with a group of fourth graders, and we would pick, you know, books that were fun, but they were about emotions and they were about sharing their emotions. 
That concept of circle time and talking about those things are very super important. We, we found, especially for our young boys, my key takeaways is that if we believe trauma can be experienced collectively, then we have to have solutions that are community-based and collective too. Don't rush through your values, making sure that you're settled down on what it takes. Same thing when you have integrated partnerships. Doctors approach things different than social workers, than lawyers, than teachers. What are those values? What do we need to know? How do we get a hold of them so we can move forward? What's our clear and shared vision? Again, change has to come from this top. I can't be living in on 139th Street and not doing what I say that it's important for people to do. It has to be adopted by the whole organization, can't just be some, and there have to be designated specific resources and clear outcomes and measures of results. I um, wrote this Audrey Lord um, quote because I think it's the importance, right, of sharing and admitting when you have pain. And this idea we get to so quickly to resilience. And yes, of course, resilience is important. I told you that story about Damon and what we had to do, but I need to be clear. We all need to be clear that we all are walking through the rain and walking through moments when we need support. That allows us to really work in partnership with others. And the last slide is just about us thriving together. This is staff and families, and I'm probably in here somewhere too, deciding that we're going to accept healthiness and wellness and we're going to put our money where our mouth is because that's the only way that we could really do it together. I'm going to end by saying I talked a little bit about joy and about love and about commitment. This work is not a sacrifice to me. It's not a burden. It's a sacrament. It's sacred. It is work that I've been called to do and that I am blessed and privileged and honored to be able to do. Don't walk into this career of yours thinking that you're coming here to save somebody. Don't think that um, you have answers that are better. We know, and remember, if you don't remember anything that I told you, that these issues are complex. They are systemic. They have been that way for a long time, so it's gonna take all of us rowing in the same direction for a very long period of time in order to get it right. We don't have to leave our children behind. We can make a difference. You all can make a difference right now. You are your best instrument. You're gonna to learn tools. You're gonna to have all this stuff that you're gonna do, but you are the social justice warrior and advocate that takes it from this case to a cause, that takes it from what's happening for your particular person that you're working with to something larger, and that you're constantly speaking truth about what needs to happen differently because you love the community that you're working with and because you feel called to do it. Okay, I'm gonna end there, um, Professor Ross, and then we could take questions. Well, I think we picked the perfect uh, person to kick us off for the speaker series. Um, you touched on so many things that are so critical uh, to consider, um, not just in kind of traditional health settings, but beyond. Um, I'm uh, floored because so many of the concepts um, and, and stories and uh, uh, examples that you gave are things that we have already covered in integrated behavioral health. And if we haven't covered them yet, we're getting to them um, in, in the weeks to come. Um, I'm not sure if anybody caught the example with the obesity, the, um, Prevention, universal, targeted, and indicated. It's the perfect example. Um, I'm so um, very happy to hear you kind of uh, talk about uh, family-centered care um, and also uh, trauma-informed care with this modified focus. I think that it is so incredibly important to consider the healing aspect and center that really um, in doing this work because I think that this is the only way providers are gonna survive, um, you know, and communities will benefit. Um, with that, I would like to open it up to anybody who has any questions or, or comments, especially from all of you fellows. Go ahead, Ricardo. <clears throat> uh, can I pass the mic to Eliza? I think I saw her hand up first. Did you, Eliza? Yes, please. Okay. Um, cool. Thank. Well, thank you. That was awesome. Um, 
uh, very inspiring and it's really an honor to hear you speak. So thank you for that. Um, I'm curious about, I have a lot of questions. I'll pick one to start. Um, the disconnected youth, that 18 to 24 age range, um, that's kind of a, a age I find really interesting um, in the, yeah, it just kind of seems like this like twilight zone that like we, a lot can happen. A lot of negative things can happen. I, I work in with people with substance abuse issues. And it seems like when I'm doing the assessments, a lot of stuff, a lot of the first time they try and become addicted to a substance is in that age range. So curious, any specific programs that you found that worked really well with um, that age? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's better to get them when they're younger right? Yeah. It's hard to at that point, but I think we've designed some after-school programs based on what's fun for them. And mm -hmm. so they like technology. There's one that was um, based with technology. Somehow a bunch of those young boys love culinary skills, which was really weird. So in, in uh, one of our programs, we decided to just have them do culinary skills. Um, a lot of tech interested, um, rapping, music, all those, like the, the thing is, Eliza, how do you grab them in? Yeah. And then you do all the other work. And so if you have something corny or something where they're boys or not, I mean, of course, sports, right? Opening up the gym and having that, but being like, yeah, we're going to do this first before we go and play basketball. And then I think one of the most important thing is being there always, like all the time when they need you and building that relationship, because you've got to have that so that when they do go left, you yeah. can pull them into the room. I can't tell you how many times Jeff and I have been in a room with a group of boys who have either been on the edge of just about to get arrested or just been into a gunfight or just this. And, and Jeff is trying to tell them how many people he's known that's just you know gone and that not them not having the concept of what it means to be dead, right? Because in 2019, you're not thinking about that. You're just thinking about it. Cool, right. right. And yeah. so I think... I don't have a magic bullet. All I know is that I have seen some real, I, um, yes, last week I was in the grocery and we, everybody has on their mask, obviously. And this woman was like, Miss Ann? And I was like, I couldn't remember her name, but she was this mom who had this kid that was like so bad, so crazy. They tried to kick him out of school so many times. We got him connected to um, a program that he enjoyed. He liked to draw. She showed me a picture of him now. He's 26 years old. He's doing really well. I think he works at FedEx or something like that. That child, if you would have looked at him at that age, he was, his mom wanted to kick him out of the house because it was violence. It was all kinds of stuff. Sticking with it, being with them, having something for the mom and him and just staying at it, to me is the only thing that I've really ever seen work. That persistence is key. Yeah, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Ricardo, and then I, oh, see, sure. Ol I see Olivine also. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, thank you, Anne, for your presentation. I, your uh, passion is contagious. Um, I, I'm currently at a macro-oriented uh, placement. Um, I've been learning about their uh, um, strategic planning process and their uh, quality improvement department, pretty big, and just solely focused on uh, making sure all their programs are in alignment, uh, are on course, which I appreciated you talking about as you led the Children's Zone. Uh, that's a daunting task <laughs> to keep everything aligned and, um, and to keep it uh, effective. Um, and so specifically, I was thinking just in um, this specific moment in our nation's, uh, I guess, national uh, conversation, I think each community has probably been having this conversation to different degrees, uh, and that conversation being racial justice and racial justice issues. Um, my, the, where, where I'm at, uh, it gets wider the higher you go up the ladder of leadership, um, and so that is just a signal of kind of the kinds of conversations they're having internally. Um, I'm able to sit in on a social justice work group that kind of uh, champions the conversation internally. Um, 
And so my question for you is, what is that, if at all, what, what does that conversation look like um, in Harlem, in the Children's Zone uh, now, and also, you know, in years prior, uh, et cetera? I'm just curious. Oh boy, I don't, even, I don't even know how to answer that. I would say that Harlem Children's Zone is a little tiny different because mostly all of the people who are in positions of power are people of color. Right, to have a black superintendent and a black CEO and a black COO and all that you right, it's is is powerful, even though the board was white. So let me let me get that. Let me let me say that. And so that made some stuff very complicated, right? We had a this is so bad. I'm just gonna tell you, we had a white board because we wanted, in order to sit on the board, you had to contribute five hundred thousand dollars. Um, five hundred thousand, right? So a half a million dollars in order to get a seat on the board, because we weren't playing. And we had an endowment of $435,000, which is larger than some HBSUs. And so there were trade-offs that I felt like we had to make in terms of power and white men and all that other kind of stuff. And they mostly stayed out of our business. But I think that this issue of the bigger perspective of getting them to understand, listen, our community is like this, not because it's just happenstance, but to really get to have this conversation about social justice, if I'm honest, that conversation started to happen more as I was leaving because I left in 2020. I would say that I am shocked at how many, in, if just in, in nonprofits in general, how white the nonprofit leadership in New York City still is to this day. Um, I, you know, somebody's here from JCCA, my friend Ron runs that. New York Foundling is getting a new uh, CEO, a woman of color, right? Melanie is a woman of color. Graham Wyndham, just Dan Hauser is stepping down and he's put a black, a black woman, Kim um, Harding in, in, in there. But it's like, if we're just gonna have to wait until, a, I, I don't mean to be offensive, until the old white man decided they're gonna leave, we're, it's gonna be another 50 years. So I think we have to think very strategically about what that means. Now, if all of the systems stay the same, it doesn't really matter who's sitting in the CEO seat. So when I talk to you about dismantling the front door of the child welfare system, or making sure that we take funds that are in foster care to put them into preventive. I think really looking at these system issues, Ricardo gets us there at the same time as we have to have boards looking at hiring practices and who's at the table and who's making decisions and all of those things. So I think it's a comprehensive um, answer. Thank you. I think it was Stacey Ann and then Anna. Am I getting that right? I think Anna goes first. <laughs> Olivine, did you have something though? For me? Yeah. Yes, I want to say I'm so glad to be here. I'm always hearing from teachers at Harlem's Children's Zone who've been trained at Harlem Children's Zone and I've worked with them. They've been one of the best in all of the schools I've worked in, top in, in the district. But most importantly, I think um, I'm so grateful for the work because it's community work. Harlem is close by where I live. And um, the baby and mothers program, I think it's incredible. I just wanted to know how does the community continue to inspire people in all all our children zone to come up with such innovative program that just meets the needs. Well, you it's know just what? Like, you know what? I said to you when you have a grandmother that's walking down the street who's like, I went to that program and that was no good, or that person didn't know what they were talking about. Like when you have that talk about Ricardo's talking about quality assurance, our quality assurance is like very quick and very to the point, right? People will tell you in a minute if you don't have something that they need. The Baby College has been one of our longest programs Amazing. over 20, I think 20 years. 7,900 people in Harlem have gone through the Baby College. You know how awesome that is. It's and amazing. Then the word of mouth continues because it's a high quality program that's based on science. All of the people who are the um, instructors look like the people who are in the program. And I just think people have fun. Man, if you can ever go to a baby college graduation, it is the most fun. And then they stick together. People will be like, I was in cycle 17. And now this is my cohort of, of moms and parents that I stay with as my kids get older. It's really, I love the baby college program. That's all I wanted to ask because I'm hearing, I've heard about it, 
before, even before you spoke about it. And you're right, word of mouth does travel so much about that baby program. Yep. Even yep. when I was on a bus when my daughter was little, people would just come randomly talking about it. Yeah. Like, and, and I know, think it was on a Saturday. They used to have it, it on Saturday. A lot of and, outreach going on in places mm -hmm. like on the, you yeah. know, the playgrounds and in the barbershops and in the in all the, the hairdressing places to see if people want to join. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I can go if, if I'm next. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Williams. -Isom. I'm I'm just really happy and honored to have shared this space with everyone tonight. It was like one of the more inspiring things I've gotten to be in from this past Yay. semester so far. So just thank Yay. you so much. Um, I set the so, bar high. I set the bar high. We'll we'll see what what the next people do. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Um, I'm placed this year at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn and their child and adolescent outpatient. Um, and it's been really wonderful clinical work um, and clinical experience. I've talked to Dr. Ross a little bit about some of the stuff that's been a little bit more frustrating, but one of them that I'm thinking about is that at Maimonides and especially in child and adolescent, we talk a lot about trauma-informed care um, and we do like a little bit of trauma screening, but I feel like I had that, well, I had the pleasure of reading a, an article about healing centered engagement for my field placement last year, which was like one of the biggest like mind things for me because I, it was just so amazing. And I feel like at Maimonides, this approach that's very centered in trauma informed care in a, in a system that's already very, um, a, a big system is, yep. is yep. really tough to like implement in a way that is actually best for the youth. So I feel like in the way that we do it now, it's kind of like trauma, the trauma is located like within the youth rather than within like the system outside 100%, of 100%, right? Yeah. I think, did you read Sean Gindrick's? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. yeah. I just think we've got to keep on using that language because yeah. I think inadvertently, or I don't know, on purpose, depending on how you, much you think the system kind of just cre creates these awful things, it is becoming about what's wrong with the child as opposed to what happened to you and right what and, and thinking about how what are the solutions that we can come to together and how do we heal yeah so i'm kind of trying to keep away from the trauma person even though the trauma is there right. we recognize it but i think the solutions have to be more focused on healing yeah yeah i mean that was that was really my comment and question yeah. and that was like so helpful just because i am really interested in uh, working with child sexual abuse survivors, and that's kind of where some of my experience is. So this yep. has been so helpful. That um, article changed my life too, by the way. Sorry? That article really changed my perspective on this. Yeah, too. yeah. Um, I also wanted to mention I worked at Harlem, figure skating in Harlem for a year. I don't know if you've worked with them at all. I have. Oh, yeah. Wow, very cool. It was what got me into social work. They're an amazing place. So nice, yeah. very nice. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for that presentation. <laughs> and I too am very familiar with Harlem Children's Zone, the baby college. When I worked in foster care, I um, referred a lot of parents to that program and it was like very helpful. And I found that like a lot of family court judges <laughs> really like, really like that program. Um, so my question is um, around like outcomes, um, like based on like the, your presentation talked a lot about like, you know, like parent-centered care. Yep. And um, my question regarding outcomes is um, whether whether or not you've seen like an increase in parental involvement based on the services that you've provided and whether or not you've seen like a decrease in like ACS involvement, like. So two, two things I'm gonna say, Stacey Ann, when you ask me what are the outcomes, I would probably answer you back in which particular program, right? Because all different programs have different kind of results, but I'm gonna give you a big mm -hmm. answer. And the okay. big answer in some places, we would just look at a survey. So baby college parents in particular would get, I think it was Philippa who used to do the survey for us. And it would be stuff like, is your house baby proof? Have you gotten your child immunized? Blah, 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 all of those things that you would want. And then at the end, right, take it before. And then at the end, you're taking it again to see how much did they learn and what, you know, what, how, how much did they increase their learning? One of the um, questions was about ACS because it was like, do you know what kind of things you could do with your children that would call, get you to the attention of ACS? And because we have a very high, well, a lot of parents, but a lot of um, parents that are 
um, immigrants to this country are like, of course I'll beat my kids or of course whatever. And we're like, okay, yeah, no, you can't do that. And this is, this is the way you have to discipline your children. So we would also look at those for different age groups. Um, we had moms that were pregnant moms, people who had kids that were two to three and kind of keep them in those cohorts and then compare over years how better we were doing on each one of those strategies to really help parents have different um, yeah, strategies and tools that they could use to parent. If you, we won, at one point wanted to do a cross-sectional analysis with ACS and they wouldn't allow us to get access to their data to say, have the rates of, force, of, of foster care really gone down? And we were like, you don't even have to tell us. We'll give you the names of the people who have gone through baby college and then you'll give us the analysis and it never was able to happen. I think that's one of the things when you're working with big systems, like the limitations, I still say that based on what we, we know and from just the Philibus surveys, it really felt like people were becoming better engaged. We also then, Stacey Ann, looked at it in the GEMS program, which is another thing. Are you reading to your baby? How many letters do they know? How many numbers? Are you, how many books, blah, blah, blah. All of the things that we want them to do, measuring it before, looking at it afterwards. And for me, parent engagement is a tricky word for me because you're already the parent. You don't need to be engaged. We need to be engaged with you in a way that gives you what you need in order to do your job as a parent better. And so I have seen in every single program where we are respectful, when we make it accessible. So like in the GEMS program, we did it in Spanish and in French and in English, because that's what the community looked like. And people wanted to get that service in their own language. When we figured out, and I think, I forget who just asked me that question. How did you keep on getting better? We keep on getting better because we listen to the customer and we're like, what more do you want? And how do you want it? And what, how should we change this? and stay innovative in that way. I think it's like the best of customer service. And I hold my, count, my staff accountable because if something bad goes on and there's a complaint, you've been disrespectful, you haven't followed up, you haven't met your goals, you're probably not gonna work there anymore. So I think all of that keeps this level of excellence. So it's, it's we, we're good, we love, we're touchy-feely, but we're also really serious about what we're measuring and making sure that we're getting it done because we have a sense of urgency around children. And there's a question in the chat. For Healthy Harlem, how did you involve families so that what you were teaching kids was reinforced at home? So there was something called Family Fit that I didn't talk about. And Family Fit, you got to, um, you know, apparently people love to work out for free, like come to the armory. We gave them free cooking classes. Everybody's into like these cooking classes. We gave them simple recipes. We'd send the kids home with recipes. And so now it's like, you can learn math with your kids because they're measuring. We're doing eggs together. We're doing all this kind of fun stuff. And so we made it this whole family fit kind of um, perspective. You all think I was joking about uh, Whole Foods? Like we got a group of mothers together and we would go. It's our community pride office, which is like the community arm, and take a group of moms to go shopping. We'd go to the farmer's markets when there were farmer's markets and be like, okay, this is how you can tell what's in season. And so we would really just try to do something that was engaging and fun. We'd have um, cook-offs, right? You know, you know how people of color love to cook. So we're like, okay, we're gonna make these our things, but we're gonna make them healthy. So we're not gonna have fried chicken, we're gonna do baked chicken. It was so hilarious because you know, there was such resistance at the beginning because I have a 91 year old mother who lives with me still, who's like, I don't wanna eat whole wheat bread. Why are you trying to make me eat that? Or I don't wanna eat this. I'm like, mom, you gotta start eating. I'm 91 years old. I don't need to any of that stuff I did fine. So you, she's a lost cause. But in the community, when we're getting together, it's kind of like, how do you take the culture and, and put it together with giving people information in all seriousness. When you look at the levels of cancer, when you look at the levels of hypertension, when you look at the levels of um, you know, stroke and all of these different things, it's such a high rate of breast cancer. I had breast cancer two years ago. And I hate to say, it was such of a interesting time to be able to talk about breast cancer awareness, right? And to, we did a mar our own little march didn't want to make the little ones too afraid that something bad was going to happen to Miss Ann, but we did early detection. When I ran the marathon, we were like, Miss Ann ran the marathon. Some people don't want to drive 26 miles. We're going to all go together and we're going to watch and we're going to cheer. Like, what? how do you get people involved in something that maybe they wouldn't actually come to? You just have to make it fun. There's like no magic around that. 
And so that's what I pay people for. It's like to come up with good ideas. And if there's not kids in your program or if the adults are not coming or if the grandfathers are not showing up, you are responsible. It ain't about them. It's about you having to sign something fun that's good enough for them yet. Yvette, why are you smiling? Yvette got that big smile on her face. You still making fried chicken and all that food? Are you trying to, you gonna come to Healthy Harlem? Well, much of my earlier work was around childhood obesity. So oh. I certainly have done my share of focus groups, informing practitioners, informing families on healthy eating. And what I often found was it wasn't that they didn't know, but that a lot of motivational factors went into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so even the, the, they could have access, but there were a whole lot of other factors weighing into whether I choose the donut or I choose the banana. Listen, um, and it's not like all of us, all of us struggle with that, right? My, my, exactly. husband, my husband's father passed away eight weeks ago and I have seen him reaching for some more chips and cookies. And I was like, you got two more weeks before we gonna go back to you being okay. Because that, that whole, right, the mourning, the loss, the stress, we know that all of that's real, but we want to give people information to make better um, decisions. Sure. And just I'll say one more thing that most of the students here with us have had a paper due recently, their SBAR assessment tool paper. And um, I got quite a few calls that where you all were really working hard to connect social determinants of health to your pop your target populations and all i did was sit back and ask you okay tell me what you tell me who you're working with oh my gosh but it was acs some of it was hard in the children's zone or schools and I, I just sat back and listened to you all and the answers to the paper came falling out your mouths that's right that's and right. and and i think the light bulb started snapping for you all that wow yeah i did have an awareness of this I just yeah. needed to talk it out. I just needed to put it out there. And so here our facilitator is, you know, in Harlem and shared with you so much of what you all were piecing together from your assignments. So this is real stuff and you're doing it. You're, you're beginning and launching into the pipeline program, but you are very steeped into the work that we've just been give, given a glimpse into a fantastic organization that has been doing the work for a very long time and hopefully uh and will stay very close to us as we go through this academic year and it's so important this fellowship and the, the right them being able to put it together so that they have those skills that they need and are be able to be even more effective in their work so it's such a gift mm -hmm. Ricardo has his hands up. I'm not reading the chat, you guys. I'm like, I'm I got it. I got you on that end. I got okay. you. On. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just double dipping, everybody. So sorry about that. Um, okay. Uh, thinking about Harlem uh, as a as a community as a whole, uh, and I'm I'm not sure if Children's Zone like how, how uh, it compares in size. It seems like it's huge. Uh, it's your huge, budget it's small. It's not all of Harlem. Okay. Um, and so I guess my question is, uh, if there have been efforts around this, whether Children's Zone as an important um, community service provider has acted as sort of a convener or if someone else is convening, um, but I'm thinking about how agencies in Harlem have partnered together in some way, if, if, if at all. Um, you know, I can imagine there's barriers to that of all kinds, depending on your community, but um, what what has that looked like or how, how have you experienced that? So I have to be honest, I actually don't think that we are the best example of playing well with other people in the sandbox. I hmm. think it's because, uh, there's a lot, well, I'm trying to think of what, how can I say it in a nice way, besides the fact that we like, we don't have a lot of patience a lot of people come and they're like, oh, these are our measures. And we're kind of like, yeah, no, we don't want to do that. We'd like to do things our own way, which is the way that something works. We don't like to experiment on kids. Um, we think leadership matters, right? I hope you heard me say or, or, or heard that. We think leadership really, really matters. So we're not just going to be down with you just because you have an organization 
that's in the community. We believe quality really matters. And I have to tell you, we do have a lot of resources and the Harlem Children's Zone model is very expensive. And so it's very expensive in the sense that it's about $5,000 per child on average. That means that our early childhood programs are probably $30,000 per child. When you think about from eight o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night and everything that I talked about in the healthy Harlem and all of that, right? Nobody in the emotional wellness, nobody, there's no line that we got money from that. And so um, I say to people though, and so that's another reason why it's sometimes difficult for us to partner some other organizations are not as well resourced. Some of them don't have as much flexibility as we have. All of these kind of things. So the, the culture of the two organizations have to match. I think what Jeff's idea was, and I really embraced it, was we're trying to set a model so that we can prove to the country that it's never been about what the kids and the families couldn't do. We need to do it. And while you will spend $167,000 you know, in total to incarcerate somebody at, at Rikers, but you want to tell me you can't scale the Harlem Children's Zone because it's too expensive, right? That's bullshit. Can I say bullshit? And so it is about political will and it's about what you are willing to do. And I think so partly we have stayed insular and really focused so that we can continue to have these high results and with the hope that people will pick it up and say, this, yeah, this is what we need to do and this is how much it costs. Not for all the kids, but for these particular kids that need the support. Thank you. And I, I know that you all, I became aware of Harlem Children's Zone with my longstanding relationship with Boys and Girls Clubs. That's where I did my first internship out of social work school at, in the Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, and so I still consult with and work with them uh, today. And if it's not a Harlem Children's Zone or if it's not a Boys and Girls Club, um, then what is in your community? That's the challenge that I have for you all find out what is in your community um, because it may not be to the scale of a Harlem Children's Zone, but it's still a resource in your community until we can get a Harlem Children's Zone in all areas. And, and Eva, to your point, it's nothing that I've said here tonight has been like rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't say, oh, this is a program, whatever. I said, this is what kids need and we should give kids what they need until they don't need it anymore. And we should give it to everybody equally. That's really what I said. And so thinking about what that looks like in your community and who's there and who has that desire and who, you know, what, what places you can connect to, I think is, it's possible for every community. It certainly doesn't have to be the Harlem Children's Zone. Mm -hmm. And an integrative seminar, I will be asking you in a couple of weeks, what have you found? What's in your neighborhood? What's oh. in your community? I'll be asking, we can follow up on this one. Oh, good. I saw Olivine and then I saw Brenda. I just have a question. Um, I noticed that um, working in the independent schools, like a lot of children are coming out of Harlem's children's zone to be placed. And I'm seeing the emphasis that Harlem puts on education and community. And I'm wondering how does that, um, what's the community's take on that? I'm not saying that because it's an investment. These children, this school actually has one of the top exhibition rate. It's been known to have one of the top um, Where do you work, chess club. Uh, right now, I'm, calling, I'm currently at Columbia Grammar, but I was aware yeah. of the intermix of what's going on in Manhattan. So I'm wondering, yeah. how does that sit so well? I don't, have an, I don't have an official opinion on that. Okay. Because we at the Harlem Children's Zone wanted to, we are not the kind of program that's like, I'm going to have these kids and they're going to be the cream of the crop so that I can send them off into mm -hmm. other schools. That's not what we ever wanted to do. But of course, parents have choice. And you do know if you go to a Columbia Grandma, a Trinity, a Collegiate, a Brearley, one of those schools, mm -hmm. your trajectory of what that looks like once you get in there, if you can deal with what that is like to be a black or brown kid from Harlem exactly. school, then, right? I, so I think parents have to balance that. I would never say anything about that because as a parent, my husband and I made very different decisions for, we did not send our kids to public school. We did not trust the public school system with our children, right? We were not gonna do that. We got three now that are uh, college graduates and, and felt like that was the right decision for us. So, but I do see a lot of parents trying to figure out what is that ticket or what is that way that I can ensure that my kids are successful? The, the only reason why I'm asking, because if you look at the exhibition rate for Harlem success or Braille or Dalton, it is very similar neck to neck. So that's why I'm like, you know what, what is happening here? Except for everybody's not a Harlem success, right? Exactly. That's true. That's true. 
that's don't get that twisted. Don't get it twisted. I, I, I'm, you know? not, I'm not. I'm not. And that's I'm why not, this I'm, is so messed up that we're still parents can't have access to their neighborhood school that's still a good school. So that exactly. is a whole nother conversation. Yeah. That we can have. But I'm sorry, I just wanted to know my head was in there because of where my internship is and what I'm seeing and where the children are coming from and also who the children are playing against and you know things that they're doing. And so in Harlem success does come up a lot. So I'm just like, she's here, let me ask her. <laughs> so oh, wait, I'm not Harlem success. Remember Harlem success is Eva Moskowitz. We're the Promise Academies, which is the Harlem Children's Zone. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank You're you. welcome. Brenda? Um, I think, you know, everything um, about Children's Harlem Zone, I feel like there are so many services in that one place. I feel like that makes it a lot more helpful for the community. I feel like they just get more comfortable. They get more engaged. They become more involved. Um, and they actually start feeling that sense of community, which I think is just very important for them especially you know people that come from different cultural backgrounds because I feel like having that sense of family or community is uh, is just very crucial for them. Yeah a hundred percent and people vote with their feet. I want to keep on saying that over and over again and so that's why we owe them so much to make sure that we're giving them a quality um, I didn't want to say services but supports in the same way that I my father my oh that was a Floydian slip my husband and I certainly needed supports when we were raising our three kids and if we didn't have my mom who lived with us and helped us. And to this day, she does, you know, we wouldn't have made it. So Shania has her hand up. I know we're running tight on time, but I would love to hear from you. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm curious, I really loved your speech about Harlem Trinja Zone and their mission and everything. I'm curious to, like, I wanna know, how do you envision a future for the community Harlem, because recently um, I've been talking to like a lot of different people. Like I've talked to this woman who grew up in Harlem and she was telling me and reminiscing on the past of Harlem and how great it used to be um, as a community. And, you know, in school, I learned about the, the Harlem Renaissance and how it was filled with like black entrepreneurs and artists and musicians. And then now we see you visit, you know, 125th Street in Harlem and you can see, you know, there are people who um are struggling with mental health or who are struggling with addiction um and but i know that with harlem children's zone and other companies in harlem that we're rebuilding harlem so how do you so, see it so miss miss shania you talk about my community that's where i live that's where i love on sunday morning i walk down my beautiful you know brownstone strivers road block and i walk to church I see the historical buildings all around. The, I, I still said Harlem is the mecca of African-American culture in this country. There are beautiful musicians and artists and, and all kinds of places of education. And we have struggles block by block. And I'm sure if I go to Hollywood Boulevard, there's you know crackheads in Hollywood and, and every place in this country. But I think that um, it's not so much about rebuilding Harlem, it's about what we worry about. My husband and I is gentrification and making sure that we still are able to keep this a place where black and brown communities still have the majority of houses. It's super expensive around here to buy a brownstone now. I'm very happy to say that both of my adult children live in Harlem. One lives 10 blocks from me and the other one lives, I guess that's a good sign, right? That means that we're a good mom, that they didn't wanna move too far. And it also meant that they got to see the importance of this community and they didn't decide that they just wanted to move out as soon as they are working. Do I worry about Ayana coming from the train station late at night? I do, but I think I would be worried about her if she was on 85th Street also. And so I don't wanna give you, and so thank you, Shania, I'm gonna take that last word. It is a beautiful community. It is full of people who love their children and strengths and cultures and all of those things. We just have to make sure that those that where we are only as strong, strong as those who are the weakest of us. And so we want to make sure that we are being strong and we have good schools and all of those things so that children and families can thrive. But I'm gonna live here till I die. I'm not moving out. I still, I love my brownstone. Thank you. Thank you for that. I went to high school in Harlem. So Harlem is really close to my heart as well. There you go. All right, we're good, Professor? We are good. I'm gonna pop a little Abby, what are you saying? 
I know I was saying I was popping a little survey in the chat. Grab that link. I'll also send it out. It's um the kind of the survey that we do after every speaker series, you know. I am so going we'll to also send you the article about the Healthy Harlem, the, the yeah. article that they did about that. Um, again, Dr. Williams Eisen, thank you so much um, to everybody in here who's studying integrated care, integrated behavioral health, all these things. You know, you watch that video about Wendy who goes to her one stop shop integrated care uh, facility. That's got nothing on the Harlem Children's Zone in terms of the community investment and how they've really taken it to the next level in terms of integrating all of um, the important components of what people uh, need in order to be healthy. Um, and with that, I want to thank Dr. Williams Eisen uh, for coming and joining us and sharing these stories. Um, and we can't wait to have you back.